send in the clowns. Feel the terror of copyright. The world is a mess. <laughs> Oh boy, there go all my YouTube hopes and dreams down the drain again. Hey, Georgie. You want to find out how to avoid getting copyright claimed on YouTube? I can show you. But I thought YouTube hears our concerns and they care about creators. Susan said so. Oh, Georgie, you dumb, ignorant child. This may come off as a bit of a news flash to you. But Susan is a lying corporate shill who only cares about appeasing billion-dollar corporations. Either that or she's just really, really incompetent. Society doesn't care about helping people like us, so it's up to us to help ourselves. Come along with me down the spiral, and I'll show you what YouTube doesn't want you to know. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. In part one of the series, we talked about YouTube's content ID system and how it's not exactly the fairest method for dispensing copyright claims. What you're about to see in this video are real techniques YouTubers use to avoid content ID detection. Now, before we get into them, I have to say officially that I am not endorsing the activities shown in this video. I am presenting these topics for educational purposes only. Whether you choose to exercise these options is your own choice. I am simply pointing out that these options exist. So with that out of the way, we are now ready to explore the seedy underbelly of the copyright system. Welcome to the business of copyright smuggling. Much like squatting in someone's house, copyright smuggling is a form of civil disobedience that attempts to put the fair back into fair use. Many YouTubers already engage in copyright smuggling without even realizing it. Have you ever published a video containing an image you did not create? Well, you just smuggled it. Unless you paid to license the image or got express permission from the owner to use it, then chances are you just committed copyright infringement and probably got away with it. That's right, the little line of text you see while browsing Google Images actually means something. Now, upon this startling accusation, several questions may be popping through your head, such as, how am I even supposed to get permission from the owner of a random internet image where there's often no way to identify them? Should it really be illegal to post an image for a five second joke in a video? How can you claim to own something that's been freely spread by millions of people since the beginning of the internet? Shouldn't the legal system focus on more important matters, like actual criminals who do physical harm to society? To which the response is, boo-hoo, shut your mouth, suck it up, and deal with it. That's how the law works. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Okay, time's up. Luckily, we don't really have to deal with it because just like driving five miles an hour over the speed limit, image copyright on the internet is barely ever enforced. Since the beginning of the web, images have been a core component of content sharing, memes, and internet culture in general. Image sharing is so ingrained in the culture of the internet that every browser is designed with an option to copy and save an image just by right-clicking on it. Copy that. And even when that fails, you can always just use the print screen button. Since copying images is so fundamentally rooted in basic internet activity, attempting to police image copyright online seems like a daunting, foolish, and ultimately pointless exercise. But it doesn't stop some companies from trying. Earlier this year, Shutterstock attempted to take down the Spiffing Brits channel for briefly using their watermarked images, which despite being watermarked and unusable in non-joking circumstances, are apparently still illegal to use. That's how the law works. This was most likely just a rare and isolated case of Shutterstock trying to make an example out of someone. And your chances of actually getting in trouble for posting someone else's image in your video is almost non-existent. However, as we've seen, it's still very possible. In general though, smuggling copyrighted images is very easy. Smuggling video, on the other hand, is a lot more tricky. 
Images are fine, but oftentimes YouTubers want a little more to differentiate their content from a glorified PowerPoint. I mean, after all, we do make videos, you know, the thing you're watching right now. So it's often preferable to fill it up with moving images rather than static ones. A very obvious solution would be to just record your own footage. Just go out and film a bunch of stuff and you won't have to deal with copyright claims. A good idea in theory, but far less doable when you realize that you need to invest in a good camera and a tripod or stabilizer if you want the footage to be watchable. And that's in addition to the amount you have to spend traveling to wherever you have to go to film your footage. For many YouTubers, the cost of filming footage is simply not worth it. Some YouTubers instead choose to pay for stock footage, which is a perfectly valid strategy. However, relying only on stock footage can often leave your videos feeling hollow and generic. Where's the pizzazz? Huh? Look at this place! I mean, what is the theme here? It's boring! Oftentimes you'll find that whatever footage library you're paying to use doesn't have the specific clip you're looking for, which can end up disconnecting your visuals from your narration, causing them to feel aimless and arbitrary. If you want your footage to feel aimless, you'd be better off using gameplay footage, which you can record for free. Recording yourself playing a video game has been a staple of YouTube content ever since the days of the Let's Play. There's a reason why it's stereotypical for beginner YouTubers to make Minecraft videos. Because gameplay videos are a simple and inexpensive way to start making YouTube content while remaining mostly free from copyright trouble. I say mostly because some developers consider footage of their games to be copyrighted content, despite the unique inputs of the player. For years, Nintendo infamously garnished the revenue of YouTubers uploading footage of their games. Every now and then you'll also see some butthurt indie developer issuing copyright takedowns to silence criticism. However, just like with image use, you'll rarely get in trouble for uploading gameplay footage, because most developers simply don't care, enjoy the free publicity, or fear getting barbarically punished by the wrath of angry gamers. So essentially, smuggling gameplay is as easy as knowing which developers will let you. But let's get more risky. How do you get away with using legit copyrighted footage from movies and TV shows? Well, it turns out there's a group of people on YouTube who have spent years tinkering with this very question. Our old friends, the bootleggers. Bootleggers exist to outsmart and trick the content ID system, and we can use their expertise to help smuggle our own content. These are some of the ways I've learned to slip copyrighted videos past the system, some more practical than others. The first way is to just upload the video in very low quality. I'm talking 240p or less. Obviously today we no longer live in caveman times back when everyone had dial-up internet. So 240p quality isn't exactly ideal, but it's a valid strategy nonetheless. Whenever you search for a TV clip on YouTube, you're far more likely to find 240p videos than 1080p ones. This indicates to me that the system has a far harder time detecting low quality videos. It's like natural selection in a way, and you can use YouTube search to learn which strategies will contribute to your copyright survival. Another strategy I've learned through YouTube search is that reaction videos are apparently claim proof. Guys, I have no idea what is going on right now. I figured this out when I periodically went to look up some YTPs, only to find that the original video had been taken down while a trail of reaction videos continued to survive. For some reason, if you film your ugly potato head and put it in the bottom corner of the video, you can magically make your content immune to copyright takedowns. How can reaction channels get away with this while other YouTubers who actually commentate and critique the material get punished? The world may never know. However, based on the idea of the face cam shield, we can infer that obscuring the copyrighted content in some way can help deflect claims. From this theory, you can derive that a fat ice or watermark or logo will do the same trick. Additionally, you can use the border of the video player itself to obscure the footage by zooming in. You can also do the opposite to achieve a similar outcome by cropping and panning the video to a smaller window in the frame. Filling up the negative space with some sort of colored border also helps. If that's not enough, you may have to do even more to transform the material. You can try flipping the canvas, adjusting the color or saturation, applying a vignette or other lighting effects, among many other visual distortions. One technique I've picked up from the real gyms is to deconstruct a video into a series of images. This can help you deal with those really pesky scenes that always seem to get claimed no matter what you try. But out of everything I've mentioned so far, possibly the most helpful trick is to keep your footage short and choppy. 
Remember, the Content ID system is designed to prevent re-uploads of TV shows and movies, so it's designed to detect long, uninterrupted stretches of content. You can avoid detection by cutting out parts of your footage in brief intervals and making sure that the footage doesn't play for too long. Acceptable. If I had to estimate based on my own experience, I'd say that 5 seconds or less is most likely safe, 20 seconds is pushing it, and 30 seconds or more is too risky. As you've probably figured out by now, smuggling copyrighted video on YouTube can require a lot of acrobatics, but even that pales in comparison to the most hotly contested content on this website, music. Over the past few years on YouTube, possibly the single biggest nuisance to creators on the platform have been music companies. Out of all media types, copyrighted music is the most heavily scrutinized by the Content ID system. In the old days of YouTube, you used to be able to get away with playing 10, maybe 20 seconds of a song without getting caught. In recent times, people have been getting claimed for less than 5 seconds. One of my YouTube poops was claimed for using the scream from Won't Get Fooled Again, a 3 second clip. Yeah. Wow. And if you think that's crazy, wait till you hear about the time I got claimed for zero seconds of footage. That's right, my Never Ever on Spongebob once got claimed for using the Spongebob Squarepants theme song. The only issue with that being that the song wasn't anywhere in the video. So let's step back for a second and think about what this actually implies. I didn't actually use the song they claimed I did meaning the Content ID system couldn't have detected it, meaning that some dude working at Sony Music must have manually claimed the video on a whim because the video is about Spongebob, so they felt that there probably was some Spongebob music in it, and YouTube just allowed them to submit this totally baseless claim. Thankfully, the claim was so ridiculous that I guess even the music company felt bad about it, and they actually released the claim after I appealed it. So that was all fine and dandy until a few months later when they claimed an entirely different song that wasn't in the video. That's how the law works. Nonsense claims like this are why I list my music in a pastebin link, to prevent my video from showing up in search results of copyright hounds. Fortunately for us, we most likely won't have to deal with claims this egregious anymore, because this summer YouTube announced that rights holders can no longer claim videos without first providing a timestamp and that they can no longer take revenue for less than 5 seconds of content. Good changes for sure, however it raises the question of why these options were even allowed in the first place. If you think I got screwed by this, just look at the Fat Rat, a YouTube musician who had his original song stolen by a fake copyright holder who took advantage of YouTube's easily exploitable system. And if you need one final example to really nail down how berserk YouTube copyright is for music, my Never Ever on the Cold War featured a clip from Pulp Fiction. You could argue that it was fair use, you could also argue that it wasn't. I felt I was using it for rhetorical purposes, but I accepted the risk given that it was 20 uninterrupted seconds of copyrighted material. Well, it turns out that this part of my video did get claimed as a song. That's right, apparently this movie scene was sampled by a 1995 Cypress Hill song, and they got to claim my video because of it. So according to YouTube's copyright system, a rap song sampling a movie scene is perfectly fine. But when I make a video sampling that same scene, I somehow owe royalties to the rap group? What kind of jacked up logic is that? If anything, I should be paying royalties to Miramax Pictures, but the power of music copyright on YouTube is so strong that it completely leapfrogs the rights of movie companies. Video game commentator Jim Sterling has famously utilized YouTube's belligerent music claim system in what he calls the copyright deadlock. And I mean, if you weren't going to make money off it anyway, you might as well make a mockery of the system and take a petty little victory as reward. YouTube, this is what you make me do now. This is where we're at. We have a system where it's actually better to infringe on as much copyright as possible than abide by fair use. A system where I'm now not worried about using whatever music or footage I like because it literally doesn't matter whose rights I'm encroaching on anymore. Once you've taken the first step into Infringement Valley, you can't make it any worse for yourself. 
Anyway, you've probably realized by now that smuggling copyrighted music on YouTube is a pretty tall order. So much so that, in my expert opinion, you shouldn't attempt it at all. Changing the speed and pitch of a song can usually help avoid a claim, but corrupting the audio to that extent often defeats the point of using the song in the first place. Compared to video, we are much more perceptive to distortions in music, so altering a song can often be distracting to the audience, certainly not an ideal situation for creators. The only non-intrusive edit you can realistically make to a song is raising and lowering the volume. While it's possible to avoid a claim by lowering the volume enough, for many songs this lies around the faintest threshold of being able to even hear the song, making it a counterproductive solution in most cases. The fact of the matter is that some songs on YouTube are simply untouchable. Any Billboard Top 40 song from the past 10 years will get insta-claimed. Same goes for legacy hits, basically all the songs that get played on throwback radio stations. Some songs are so protected that you won't even find them on Vivo. This is true for most songs from Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles. Thankfully for copyright smugglers, not all songs are created equal in the eyes of Content ID. Your ability to smuggle music depends almost entirely on which songs you select. Songs with vocals are the most likely to get caught by the system. The human voice leaves a very distinct waveform, making it very easy to identify for detection software. Of course, you're most likely going to be using music as background audio for narration, so you probably shouldn't be using lyrical content anyway. A good technique for both copyright smuggling and general content is to stick to instrumentals. Perhaps the most common example of this on YouTube is the widespread use of royalty-free music from artists like Kevin MacLeod. Yeah, it turns out that the pathetic YouTube audio swap tool from 2008 grew up into the YouTube audio library, an actually decent resource for royalty-free music built right into the website. While you can find plenty of decent tracks here, the audio library is a default option for a ton of YouTubers, and as a result, a ton of YouTubers are going to be using these songs. And just like with stock footage, stock music can easily leave your videos feeling hollow and generic. You could say it's all worth it for the copyright protection, but not even that is guaranteed. So I made a video in early 2017 called Dashcon, and in it there's a track which is royalty free, it's in the Creative Commons under a 3.0 license, and the only stipulation is that, you know, please credit it in the description, all that sort of stuff. So there I was, living my life, and suddenly I got a copyright claim notice. Two and a half years and eight million views after the video first came out. And it said that this Creative Commons license track is now subject to copyright, claimed by, I won't say who. So I dispute the claim, I send the guy a message on Twitter and hope for the best. But when I found his Twitter, I see that there's actually all these other tweets going, you know, at his name and a bunch of other people who all have the same problem. It's like a thousand people have all been copy claimed. Turns out this is what he did. He had seen how many views he got on his royalty free music. So he tried to take the thing out of the Creative Commons. And the way he was going to do this was make an announcement on his personal website and say, hey, you've got a year's notice as if we were ever going to read his personal website. And then otherwise, if you use the music after 2018, you're subject to a $50 license. Anyway, I sent him a message and I said, yeah, look, I'll pay the ransom. Just give me my video back as soon as possible. And then, you know, I'll, I'll deal with the problem from there. The, the priority was to get the video back. Anyway, whatever. I just said, yeah, fine. And I'll, I'll deal with it later. But the best part was, okay, while all this is going on, everyone else is just like furious. They're not going to pay the ransom. And Keemstar catches wind of this. And uh, all of a sudden, this dude is just getting trashed from every direction. And it's absolutely hilarious. Anyway, long story short, two days later, his Twitter is gone. His email is gone. If you try to email him now, it just returns to recipient. And all of the claims were dropped. And as far as I can tell, his presence has been pretty much wiped from the internet. More risky than royalty-free music is music from independent online artists. Stuff like Vaporwave, Synthwave, and Lo-Fi Hip-Hop Beats to Relax slash Study To are not registered as royalty-free, but the artists are typically chill enough to not care about policing their copyright. If you're feeling extra ballsy, you could try using background tracks from popular songs, whether it's hip-hop instrumentals or karaoke versions of rock songs. 
Typically, music with easily identifiable drum and bass signatures are more likely to be claimed. So if you want to use a popular song but fear copyright punishment, you can try finding an 8-bit or MIDI version of the song. Otherwise, you might be better off using something more irregular like jazz or classical music. Contrary to popular belief, classical music does frequently get claimed on YouTube. Even though the songs are public domain, they often succumb to performance claims. But with that being said, it's pretty easy to use classical music as long as you're talking over it the whole time. Jazz is a bit more tricky to get away with because the genre is much more contemporary. A good rule of thumb when judging the copyright risk of a song is that older songs tend to be less risky because less people care about them and music companies have less of a reason to ruthlessly guard them. The same theory applies to songs which are historically obscure, songs that no one would probably know about if it wasn't for, ironically, YouTube's algorithm promoting them. These songs aren't risk-free, but music nerds will respect you more if you use them. However, with all that considered, the holy grail of smugglable music on YouTube can be found in video game soundtracks. While video game publishers own the rights to their music, very few of them actually bother to enforce their copyright. Most video game music isn't even registered in the Content ID system or any digital music bank, making them practically free to use on YouTube. In fact, most game developers haven't actually released their music commercially, and the copies you find on YouTube have been ripped directly from the game itself. Video game music tends to have much more variety than the typical royalty-free music you'll find on YouTube, and in my opinion, it tends to sound a lot better too. Rarely will you find a video game song that gets copyright claimed, but just to be sure, you can check if the song is at risk of a claim by looking for licensing text at the bottom of the description on YouTube. If the raw version of the song isn't claimed, that means it's bound to be safe for use in your video, but that still doesn't guarantee that it's going to be safe forever. Oh. 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 Paradox resolved. If you copyright smuggle in a video, the system is bound to catch up with you eventually. Nearly all copyrighted content is doomed to get claimed at some point. My back catalog of videos is in ruins from claims that have gradually piled up over the years. As your channel grows, so too does your risk of encountering copyright claims. The stuff you can get away with now is likely going to get you caught a few years down the line. So as a YouTuber, you have to continually search for safer options. Personally, I'm not too upset about this because I don't mind losing out on pennies of revenue from old YouTube poops that nobody watches anymore. And to be honest, it would be very foolish and entitled of me to expect revenue from old content that nobody watches anymore. So with all that said, if you choose to lead the life of a copyright smuggler, be sure to smuggle responsibly. When asked by those seeking advice, Isaiah responded simply with a phrase which would soon become a mantra. Don't get hit. But wait just a second here. Why should we have to worry about any of this? Copyright smuggling isn't some new, groundbreaking thing. People have been manipulating content to post online for ages now. Even though this whole time, the law has dictated that we shouldn't. Is copyright smuggling even ethical? And if not, then how is it so normal? Coming up in part three of YouTube Copyright School, we examine why things are the way they are. People of society, it is I, Joker Emp, standing here in front of a pile of money that I've made from copyright smuggling and selling your personal data. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Guess my password before the time runs out. Having a little trouble? Well, that's because I use Dashlane to generate a password so secure that none of you can possibly guess it. Up, up, up. Click out of this ad and I'll make the FTC fine you $42,000. I'm just trying to show you how pathetic your attempts at online security really are. I've been taking a look at some of your passwords, and some of these are so idiotic that you'd have to be insane to think that they could protect you from today's breed of script kiddies and keyboard warriors. Introduce a little anarchy into your password, and only then can you survive the chaos of the digital downward spiral. Well, time's almost up. Did you figure it out? <sighs> Boy, betcha didn't expect that, now did ya? That's the power of Dashlane. 